So here in John chapter 4, where I start the, the, this passage, a real famous passage with Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And that's what we're we'll going to be looking at first this morning is his conversation with this, with this woman. And, you know, they have this conversation back and forth. Now, this woman was a Samaritan. And back in, in those days, of course, the, the Jews didn't really have any dealings with the Samaritans. They, they, they had separated themselves. So when the disciples show up with the, you know, they had gone into town, they come back and they see Jesus talking to this woman. They're like, why is he talking to this Samaritan woman? But they don't say anything. But the conversation he has with the Samaritan woman, you know, he says, hey, give me something to drink. And she's like, well, what are you doing, you know, talking to me? I, you know, I'm a Samaritan and you're, you're a Jew. Like, why are, you even, why are you even asking me for this? And he said, you know, if you knew who it was that's asking you to give a drink, he's like, you'd be asking me for a drink. And he goes on about, about the, um, you know, everlasting uh, life, basically. But he talks about, you know, waters. He said, whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And he's trying to explain that, like, you need something of me. Like, I just asked you for water, but what you really need is you need to ask me um, for, you know, for this everlasting life. For the, for the water that's going to... And she doesn't get it. And she's thinking like, oh, hey, yeah, that's great. You know, how are you going to give me that water? She's like, you don't have anything to draw the water. You have no bucket. You have nothing to put into the well to get the water. She's like, you know, I'd love to have that water so I don't have to keep coming back here and getting water. I don't thirst anymore. She didn't quite get it. She's still thinking like physically. And then he, um, he goes, well, go ahead and call, you know, call your husband. And she's like, I don't have a husband. And he tells her, you know, of course, well, you've, that's, hey, at least you said that true because you've had five husbands and, the, you know, the guy you're with right now, that's not your husband. And that takes her back. She's like, whoa. She's like, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. You know, like, wait a minute. <laughs> you know all this stuff about me. I think you're a prophet. And then she goes on. Now she starts to come around and get it a little bit more, what he's talking about, seeing that he's a prophet. He's not just some random guy sitting at the well just asking her for a drink of water. And, and now she's saying, wait a minute, he's a prophet. And she says, now, so, so now she starts bringing up spiritual things. She's saying, okay, well, you, you know, the Jews, you guys say that you need to worship in Jerusalem. You know, but our father said that we need to worship over here. And um, she says, and he, say, he answers her in verse 21. He says, woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the father. Ye worship, ye know not what. He's saying, you don't even know what you worship. You guys think you know what you're doing. You're going up and worshiping this mountain. You don't even know what you worship. He says, for, uh, for salvation is of the Jews. The Jews had the right doctrine, um, well, by and large. I mean, it, I don't even want to say by and large at that time, but, but they were the ones who were, and, you know, it was always in Judea. You remember when the kingdom split? So it, real briefly, and I don't want to get too far into this. You know, I want to get hung up on this, but uh, as a Samaritan, people of Samaria, that was the northern kingdom of Israel. When, when Israel split up into two kingdoms, you had the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. That was after Solomon had died and Rehoboam, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the days of Rehoboam is when the, when the kingdom was split because of Solomon's sins. So he left Judah as the, as the remnant of for, for because of David's sake, to, for that line to continue going. And throughout the history of Israel, Judah was, was way more the, the righteous city. That's where the Levites went to. Remember Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, he set up the, the, the idols. And, you know, he was worried that the people were going to go back and worship in Jerusalem, and then the kingdom was going to be given back to the house of David, and all this other stuff. So, he set up the false gods. He made priests of the lowest people of the land and, and completely changed their religion. And from that time forward, basically that northern kingdom of Israel was going the wrong direction almost all the time. And there's a few times they'd have a good king or righteous king that would come into power. But by and large, they were not doing what was right by the Lord. They were worshiping Baal and they were doing things the wrong way. Whereas Judah, you know, a lot of the priests and the Levites went what, you know, after that split, they moved to Judah. So there was like more of a, of a lighthouse or a powerhouse of, of correct doctrine of people worshiping the Lord. So throughout the history, Judah was, had that place. And, um, you know, Judea, that's where the, where the Jews, the word Jew comes from. It's for people of Judea. And um, Jesus is saying, you know, well, salvation's of the Jews. They had the right doctrine about salvation, at least some of them. Obviously, the Pharisees didn't and the Sadducees didn't, but um, 
He tells her, you know, salvation is of the Jews, but the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So he says all of this to her, and then, and then the woman answers him and says, well, look, I know that Messiah is coming. So the people of the day, they knew that there was a Christ to come. They knew there was a Savior to come. And she says, well, we know that, I know Messiah comes, which is called the Christ, or which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. So she's saying, well, I, you know, I'm waiting, you know, when Christ comes, he's going to tell us everything. And then he plainly answers her and says, I that speak unto thee am he. He says, I am the Christ is what he's telling her. So he flat out says it. Now, she has a, a decision to make, obviously, to, to either believe it or not. Now, what do we have to do to be saved? We have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So at this moment, when he says that, she's the, that he is the Christ, and he's telling her these things, you know, she, I believe at this moment, she receives him. She believes him. She believes that he's the Christ. Now, what I, what I want to get into, see, the, the, the topic of my, of my um, sermon this morning, we're still continuing on in the fundamental doctrines. We did the salvation and the baptism and the King James Bible, and now we're going to be talking about soul winning. Okay, and this is really important, especially because we've got a big day coming up on Saturday. We've got a soul winning event. It's going to be all day. We're going to be going out and knocking on doors. But what I want to point out in this story is that it's, you know, we see this woman believing on Jesus, believing that he is the Christ. She knew that a Christ was coming, and then all of a sudden she's confronted with Jesus. He speaks unto her, and she goes, yep, this is him. And look at what she does, because this is very important. She just gets saved. She just believes on him. Verse number 27 says, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with her. This is what I was referring to earlier. And yet no man said, what seekest thou or why talkest thou with her? Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came on him. So the, fir the very first thing this woman does upon Believing that Jesus is the Christ, she goes out and tells other people about him. It's the very first thing that she does. And the point I want to make with this, one of the big points I want to make with this, is that you know, a lot of churches, a lot of people make things real difficult and they'll say, oh, you can't talk about the Bible because you don't really know very much. Oh, you need to get learned. You need to you know, study the Bible for a couple years. You need to take these classes. You need to get baptized. You need to do all of these other things and then we'll let you go out and come with us out soul winning and talk to people because that way then you can, you know, you can be, have the most knowledge possible to be able to answer these people. Look, I don't believe that to be true. Now, should you be learning and growing and learning more so that you can do a better job out soul winning? Yes, absolutely. But the bottom line is that soul winning is for everybody. And it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. I mean, this woman just got saved. The very first thing she does is goes into town and starts telling other people about Jesus. See, anybody who gets saved, you know how you got saved. She knows how she got saved. She put her faith in Jesus. That he is the Christ. And once she did that, she wanted to tell everyone else, hey, look, we're waiting for the Christ. He's, he's here. Isn't this the Christ? And she goes out and, and goes and tells these men and brings them, literally brings them to Jesus. That's why it says in verse 30, it says, then they, went, they, they, talking about, well, look at verse 29. Come, she says, come. See a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Come with me. Come and see this guy. And she's bringing him to Jesus. And they listen in verse 30. Then they went out of the city and came unto him. So they follow her say, okay, yeah. She's leading these people to Christ. Verse 31, and the meanwhile, you know, and then he goes on. And what also is interesting, well, I'll get into that in a little bit. Verse number 39. Jump down. I'm going to skip this passage where Jesus is talking to his disciples. Verse 39 says, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. She got people saved right away. I mean, the Bible explicitly says right there that many people believed on Jesus because of what she was said, because of her said, because of her efforts. 
And the point I want to make is, look, you don't have to know all the doctrines of the Bible. You don't have to be a Bible whiz and know where all the verses are and know where everything is in the Bible to get people saved. You can do it with one verse. You can do it with John 3.16. Now, it's going to be a little bit harder that way, but you can still do it. And see, here's the point. We need to, you know, people need to get out and start doing the work because God will bless that. And you can get results immediately. Obviously, the goal is to continue and to learn more and to be able to, to, be able to answer every question and be able, to be able to be a more effective soul winner. But the bottom line is, no matter where you're at, you need to get out and tell other people about Christ. What's also interesting in this story is that during that time that the woman left to go get people, and then when she comes back, he's giving his disciples a soul winning lesson. He talks about winning. So look at verse number 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat, because they asked him about like, food, like, like physical food. So they're like, where, where did you get some food? Because he said he, he didn't need anything. He says, uh, he says, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. And in verse 34, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me. He's saying, that's my food. I need to do the will of, that, of God. I need to do what he told me to do and to finish his work. I need to do the work that God has told me to do. Verse 35, Say not ye there are four months, and then cometh harvest? Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. He's saying, look, normally with the, with the harvest, you plant your crops and it takes four months, and then after four months, now it's time to harvest. He's saying, the, the harvest is ready. It's right now. We're not waiting any longer. There's no reason to, to wait for people to be ready to get saved. He says, look under the fields. They're white under harvest already. The time is now to go out and, and reap. Verse 36, it says, And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gather, gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. That's important. You don't miss that. He says, He that reapeth receiveth wages. When we go out soul winning, you know, obviously there's a lot of reasons to go out soul winning. I'm going to go over some of that a little bit more. But he's saying right here, when you go out and reap, you're going to receive wages. God will pay you for what you do for him. Eternal life, salvation is free. It's a free gift. Nothing, none of the good works that you do pay for that at all in one little bit. But the good works that you do do at the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to reward you for that. He's going to give you rewards of eternal value for that. Not only that, you gather the fruit. You, when you gather other people, you gather them unto life eternal. They'll be with you then in that day. And um, it says, so that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Obviously, when we go out sowing, you don't always get people saved. Sometimes you're sowing the seed. You know, we're always sowing the seed. Anytime someone will let us talk to them just a, li a little bit. Maybe they don't get saved that day. Maybe someone else will come along later and they will get saved. But you know what? That's a day of rejoicing for both him that soweth and him that reapeth. You know, I can't wait to get to heaven and see, like, maybe there's somebody that I talked to and they didn't get saved and someone else came and got saved later. I, that, it's going to be such a joyous day to see, wow, you know what? You got saved later on. Praise the Lord. Praise God. And, and you know, the other people who are involved in that person's salvation, we're all going to be rejoicing because the end result is this person got saved. Verse 37, herein is, this, is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. Verse 38, I sent you to reap that whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored and ye are entered into their labors. And I want to point out here that, you know, soul winning is a command. Jesus says, I sent you to reap. It was something that he sent people, you know, he's sending his disciples out to do and he's sending us out to do. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 126. Psalm 126. And there's a lot of naysayers out there trying to discourage you and, you know, tell you that we shouldn't go out and knock on doors and that's rude or that's confrontational soul winning and all this other stuff. And, and, and everyone likes to have, a, you know, there's always the critics. There's always the critics that want to tell you, you know, not to go and do, this, do this, something good for God. And claim that, that the way that we're doing is wrong, yet it's always these same critics that aren't doing anything. They're not ever getting anybody saved. They'll say, oh no, you, got, you just got to lead the life and just wait for people to... No, wrong. You don't wait for people to come to you. Now, if people come to you, great. 
But that's not, called, that's not soul winning, and that's not what God has ordained in the Bible for us to do. He sent them out. And we're going to get to that in just a minute, but I want, I want to see here first that soul winning works. It's guaranteed to work. So even on the days where you think that like we're unsuccessful, we go out, maybe nobody gets saved, soul winning works. You can't just go out one day and expect to have, you know, you know, every single time you go out, just expect to have this bountiful reaping. You're not always going to have that, but you have to keep doing it. And soul winning does work. Look at Psalm 126, verse number 5. The Bible reads, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. It may be hard sometimes. I mean, you sow in tears. Why are you sow in tears? Well, one could be because you care about it. Because it's, it's close to your heart and it, and it means something to you. But also it could just be a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of trouble. You have to give up things in order to go out and sow. But he says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless. And that's where we say, you know, soul winning works. The Bible says, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. There's no doubt about it. When you go out and you care, you bring forth that, that precious seed of life, the word of life out to people, even you know, weeping, caring about the lost souls that are out there and the condition that they're in, you go out, bear that precious seed, hey, doubtless you're going to come back rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. The Bible says that it works. And, that, and this is going out and sowing, not waiting for people to come to you. You don't sit at your house with seeds and just when someone comes to you, then, oh, yeah, here's a seed. No, I mean, the analogy wouldn't even make any sense. Obviously, when you sow seeds, you're going out into your fields and going out into the property, going out into the land and sowing the seed everywhere. And that is a perfect illustration of soul winning. Hey, we need to be going out and doing this. We have to trust the biblical model for bringing people to Christ there's many, soul, there's many, many verses that speak of, of winning the lost to Christ, you know, soul winning type verses. And what you're going to find among all of them is what I was just talking about. That we are told to go. That is the common thread and the common theme. You will find that in pr pretty much every single soul winning verse. You'll see references to people being sent. You'll see go. You'll talk about the feet. And here's just some of those verses. You know, in Mark 16, Verse 15, with the Great Commission, Jesus Christ, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He doesn't say, set up a big building, hold a church service, and bring them in in order to preach the gospel to every creature. See, that mentality is completely backwards. When people do that, then they start gearing their church services towards the lost and saying, well, how are we going to get more lost people in here? Church isn't for the lost. Church is for the saved. You're not trying to get more lost people in the doors. When you do that, that's why you wind up with the rocks, you know, the rock bands and the concerts and, and all of the other things that will appeal to the flesh and the lusts of the world just to bring lost people in. And then they have these big altar calls and they'll say, you know, we're going to get people saved here. And then nobody feels the responsibility to go out and win the souls because they think, oh, well, that's what church is for. And they spend more time even, you know, if anyone's trying to do anything, they'll spend more time inviting people to come to church because they've learned that, well, I'll bring them to church and, you know, the pastor's going to preach and they hopefully they'll feel convicted and then at the end of the service, they'll stand up in front of everybody and they'll walk down that aisle and they'll get saved. And they think, if, if you know, if that person doesn't get saved, well, I did my job. No, you didn't. No, you didn't because that's not soul winning. That's not bearing precious seed. You didn't bear any seed by bringing somebody to church. Now, it's not wrong to bring people to church, but that's not soul winning. Obviously, we want people to come to church. It's a good thing, but don't think that you're soul winning by doing that. Going out into all the world and preaching the gospel to every Preaching the gospel, that's you. It's not just the pastor's job. It's not just the deacon's job. It's not just certain people's jobs. It's everybody's job to preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, 19, same, uh, basically the same passage in Matthew instead of in Mark. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Go ye therefore, is what he said. Go. You go. doesn't say sit in church and bring them in and get them to come here and let them come to you. Go. Mark 6. Mark chapter 6, where Jesus sent his disciples out. 
Verse number 7, Mark 6 says, And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. And notice, he sent them out in pairs, two and two. And that's, that's the reason why we, we use that method today, is because that's what Jesus did. Now, does this say that the only way you could ever go soul winning is in pairs? No. And I've had sometimes people at the door will say, Oh, aren't you supposed to be with somebody else? Well, look, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a smart method to use. There's a lot of reasons why we do that. And the Bible says here's the method that Jesus was using, sending them off two and two in pairs. But that's not the only way. I mean, the woman at the well didn't go out in a pair with anybody. She went out by herself and started telling people about Jesus Christ. So don't think that just because you don't have a partner that you can't go out soul winning. No, look, you can do it. You say, well, I've never done it before. Well, neither did the woman at the well. She's never done it before. Well, I need to just go with somebody so I could learn. Look, that's a good idea and you'll probably get better at it, but you don't need somebody else to go with you. Just go out and tell people about Jesus. That's what you need to do. You need to go and do it. And try it. Obviously, there's, you know, you're, gonna, you're probably going to learn a lot more by being a silent partner. We do things that way. We try to get people involved, sending them out two and two. Or one person can do the talking, the other person can be there with them. But ultimately, at the end of the day, we are all responsible for our own work that we do for Christ. And you need to just go and do it. Let's keep reading here in Mark 6. Look at verse number 8. The Bible says, And, and commanded that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no, no scrip, no bread, no money in their purse, but be shod with sandals and not put on two coats. And he said unto them, In what place soever ye enter into an house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And look what it says in verse 12. And they went out and preached that men should repent. When Jesus sent them out two and two, they went out, they did it, they listened, and they went out. They were sent out and preached. They didn't hand out literature. They didn't just hand out tracts and call that soul winning. They went out and they preached. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. Look, you can preach the gospel to somebody. That is preaching. When you, when you, when you explain the gospel of Jesus Christ, when you, when you could show them the verses of the Bible, you're preaching. You're preaching the gospel. We've seen a few references here about people going and being sent. In Ephesians chapter 6, you have to turn there. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. In Ephesians 6, there's a whole list of the, of the armor of God, right? The, the armor, the helmet, and the breastplate, and, and, and the, the, the girdle, and everything that we need to be equipped and to have this great armor of God. And it says in Ephesians 6, 15, it says, "...in your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace." Your feet... The shoes, if part of God's armor is your shoes wearing the preparation of the gospel of peace. Why, if, if soul winning was only this lifestyle evangelism and it's just how you, how you uh, live your life to get people to ask you, wow, you have such happiness, wow, what's your secret? And you just wait for people to come to you that way and that's the only time you're ever going to give someone the gospel of Christ? You are not wearing the shoes of the armor of God that he wants you to wear. Because the shoes are the, are the ones that says the preparation of the gospel of peace. Why is it the shoes? Because you're just supposed to go out and preach the gospel. You're supposed to be going forth and bringing the gospel. Look at Romans 10. We're going to see basically the same thing here. Verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. It's easy. Whosoever is going to call on God shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? We can't just expect people to be called on the name of the Lord just, just randomly and people just getting saved for no reason, just, just calling out to go, hey, it's easy. Well, someone might just call on the name of the Lord then and get saved. Well, look, how are they going to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of, who, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Look, in order to, to, to call on God, they have to believe on him. In order to believe on him, they have to have heard about him. You can't believe on something you haven't heard about. In order to have heard about him, someone's got to preach it. 
Somebody's got to be telling them about Jesus. Someone's got to be explaining the Word of God and preaching the Gospel. Otherwise, there's no way that anybody's going to believe. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? They're sent out. They're told to go. Jesus Christ sent people out. This church sends people out. There's other churches that send people out. We send people out to preach the gospel as it is written. How beautiful are the feet. The feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Again, the reference to the feet. Why? Because we're going out and doing this. We're walking. We're literally going out and preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Turn, if you would, to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. You've got the book of Psalms and Proverbs, and then you'll find the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Too many people these days are making excuses for themselves. Make excuses why they can't go out. So that's why I started off with that, with that great example of the woman at the well. Because, you know, if your excuse is, well, I don't really know much about the Bible. Well, she went out and brought people to Christ. She just got saved. Brand new believer. Just got saved. And the first thing she does, hey, Jesus is over here. Come, come see Jesus. Isn't he the Christ? Ecclesiastes 11, look at verse number 4. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the cloud shall not reap. What's he saying there? He's saying, you know, people who are waiting for everything to be perfect, you know, because what happens when it's windy if you're sowing? Well, the seed's going to blow not exactly where you want it to be, right? Like you want it, you have your little trench dug, and you want all of your seeds to be lined up perfectly in that trench. Well, if I go to sow, well, if it's real windy now, they're going to be blown around. It's not going to go out the way that I want it to, right? And he says in here, um, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. So when it's time to, to reap the harvest and gather, things, oh, well, oh, it looks like it's going to rain. And I'm not going to go out and, and, and gather it. I'll, I'll wait till tomorrow. All right, we'll, we'll just wait until it's this beautiful sunny day and everything's going to be just right and then I'm going to reap. And this is the, the attitude that he's pointing out. He's saying, look, if you observe the wind, you're not going to sow. You regard the clouds, you're not going to reap. If you're waiting for that perfect opportunity to just fall into your lap, you're not going to win souls. Don't sit back and wait and say, oh, well, I can't go soul winning now because, what, you know, X, Y, Z. Well, I can't, I can't go now because this, because oh, I got this other thing going on. Oh, there's always something else coming up in the way. There's always some reason. Well, I, I don't want to go because I don't like this person. I want, you know, whatever. Whatever the excuse may be, we need to stop making excuses. Look at verse number five. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. He's saying the same way that you don't know the way of the Spirit, how the Spirit works inside of you, how the bones grow in the womb of her, how a baby, you know, a woman with child, how those bones just grow and form and fashion from these cells into this person and, and the bones are growing. You don't know how that happens. He's saying the same way that you have no idea how that works, you don't know how God's Spirit works. You don't know the works of God. So don't think that everything has to line up exactly perfectly. Well, I have to learn this much. Well, I have to do all this other stuff. Look, the works of God are beyond your understanding. We just need to be obedient and go and do these things. Verse number six, in the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand, for thou knowest not whether shall prosper, either this or that, or whether they both shall be alike good. He's saying just do it. Morning, yep, go ahead and sow the seed. Evening, yep, go ahead and sow the seed. Don't worry about the clouds. Don't worry about the wind. Don't worry about the rain. Don't worry about these things. Just go out and do it. You don't know what's going to end up working, what's going to end up keeping, and what good is going to come. You know, there's people, and, and I still remember to this day, early on in my in going out soul winning, and it still happens from time to time. There's people that you just look at, and you're like, there's no way this person's going to listen to what I have to say. There's no way that person will have anything to do with the Bible or with Jesus Christ or want to hear it at all. 
And see, that type of an attitude, someone might see that and just be like, they're just going to keep on walking and just go towards and talk to somebody else. And that is wicked and that is wrong. Hey, look, you don't know God's ways. I've seen it firsthand. I've walked up on a house, especially earlier on. I used to think this a little bit more than I do now because now I've seen God's work. And I know that, you know what, I shouldn't be judging any of these people because who knows what's going on in their life? Who knows what's going on in their heart? Their outward appearance, maybe they're in some kind of sin or whatever, but we all have some sin. Hey, look, this person doesn't mean they're not going to listen. I walked up, you know, there's this kid, and he's blaring all this punk rock music, and he's, you know, he's, I don't remember if he was, you know, whatever he was, he just looked like this type of person he's, that's not going to want to have anything to do with these church guys coming up to the house. Walk up, start talking to him, he turns his music down, he listens, and he gets saved. Never would have thought that. I mean, he looked like just his outward appearance, the way he was dressed, the shirt he was wearing, the way his hair was and stuff, looked like he would be angry and, and, and curse you out and, and yell at you, know, all this other stuff. That's the appearance. None of that happened. He actually was very polite, listened, and, and received the gospel of Jesus. And see, you never know. You never know. And I have many, many times where things like that have happened in the past. Many times. And one of the reasons why, first, you need to be bold. And don't let you know, your circumstances or your surroundings scare you off from preaching the gospel to somebody. And don't let your judgment go and be like, oh yeah, well that person wouldn't have listened anyways. No, you don't know that. You never know unless you actually go and try. You never know if your seed is going to bring forth fruit unless you actually sow it. You never know. You can't say, oh, well, that wouldn't have grown anyways. Who knows? Because God's ways are beyond our comprehension. We don't know. We don't know, like I said, everything that's been going on in that person's life. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter number 9. We need to stop making excuses. There's no reason not to go so. You don't have a, nobody, unless you're not saved, you don't have a good reason to not go so winning. You don't. Now, I get it. There are people that have health problems that maybe physically aren't able to walk and they aren't able to get around. But here's the thing. Soul winning doesn't have to just be walking up and down the streets and, and knocking on doors the way that we're doing it right now. There are other ways to preach the gospel to people, but the point is you're making an effort to, to, to go and preach the gospel to people, right? You, you're making that effort. So if you're physically capable, there's no reason why you shouldn't be going out and, and, and trying to win the loss and going out door to door the way we're doing because we're going to reach the most amount of people. But for some people that, that maybe physically are, are incapable, you know, they're, they're in a wheelchair or something and they're not really able to get around the streets and stuff, hey, you go out somewhere else. You go out to where people are. You can go out to the grocery store. You can go out to anywhere that you would go out where people are, where people are around, where people gather together, where, where you can find somebody to talk to and you bring up the gospel of Jesus Christ. You try to lead people to Christ. You can do that anywhere. It doesn't have to be at our designated soul winning times. But you ought to be doing it. Now we've seen a lot of scripture about sowing and reaping. You know, remember the receiving of rewards. And about Jesus commanding and sending his disciples out and saying, this is what I want you to do. He's made us ambassadors. This is our job. This is what we're supposed to do. But there's another motivation to preach the gospel that we haven't covered yet. And hopefully, if these other reasons aren't stirring you up enough, this one will. It's called hell. I'm sure everyone that's here today believes that hell is a real place, but when is the last time that you've actually thought about it? When's the last time that the reality of hell has even crossed your mind? I mean, think about that. When's the last time that you thought, wow, you know what? And, and in your mind, you're trying to picture what does hell look like? How horrible is that place? The screaming and the torture and the torment and people being engulfed in flames. Does it ever even cross your mind? 
Hopefully it at least crosses your mind as you're reading your Bible and you come across the passages where they're talking about hell. But we need to be reminded of the existence of hell, the place where we are saved from, but also the place that so many others are headed towards. Because literally what people are being saved from is that eternal fiery torture torment of hell. Praise the Lord, we've been saved from that, but we need to tell others as much as possible with the urgency. Look, you need to get saved because you don't know when your life is going to end and you could be burning in hell forever. And we need to look on other people and when you look at them, don't just think that, oh yeah, there's another person. You need to look at that person and say, you know, if that person's lost, they're going to be suffering and being tortured and tormented forever. We come into contact with people all the time. I'm sure you have friends, you have family. There's people maybe in businesses that you go out and you normally go to show stores. Maybe you know a cashier or whatever, all these other people, and you have this small talk with them and you like that person. Now think about those people and where are they going to spend eternity? Hopefully that is a motivation for you to get up the courage to try to tell them the truth so that they don't have to spend an eternity in hell. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. Look, Jesus talked about this place quite a bit. Mark chapter 9, verse 43. And if thy hand offend thee, this is Jesus speaking, if your hand offends thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. He's saying, you need to avoid hell at all costs. Look, if it means you have to chop off your foot or chop off your hand or pluck out your eyeball, which are all pretty extreme things to do, hey, that would be way better than spending an eternity in hell where the fire never goes out. The fire is burning continually. It says, and the worm dieth not. So you think of you know, people who are dead, you get eaten with worms. Well, the worm is just continually going, but you're continually there riddled with worms that are eating you and while you're burning and the fire is never going to be put out. It's a real place. Luke 16, he gives a whole story about Lazarus and the rich man. Right? And the rich man goes to hell and it says that in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments. As soon as he dies, he's there and he's being tormented tortured and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom and he cried and said Father Abraham have mercy on me and send Lazarus that poor dirty homeless beggar and he says that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue I don't care if it's that, that dirty stinky homeless guy hey Lord send Lazarus to just tip just, just cool the tip of his finger so he can cool my tongue put the tip of his finger in water just that one little bit. That's the relief I'm asking for. Just that one little tiny drop of water. Please put it on my tongue because I'm tormented in this flame. That's how, and it never stops. Ever. Imagine someone you love going to that place. The torture never ends. Revelation 14 Verse 10 says the same. This is talking about people who receive the mark of the beast, but it's still a good depiction of hell because the people who receive the mark of the beast are going to hell. Revelation 14, 10, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You can't even sleep. I mean, it, it's torturous enough not to sleep, but not to sleep and being in, in, in flames. No rest ever and no hope of rest. 
ever. That's why Jude says in verse 22, And of some have compassion, making a difference, and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Some people need to be saved with fear because hell is a dreadful, fearful place that nobody wants to be in. You know, a lot of people might mock at hell. They might make jokes about hell. Say, oh, well, I'd rather be in hell anyways than with you guys. I'd rather, you know. No, you wouldn't. You proud fool. The proud fools that, that make jokes at hell. Oh, yeah, well, they think they're going to be ruling and reigning in hell with Satan as if Satan's their buddy and cares about them and is their friend. No, you won't. You're going to be tortured with Satan. It's not a laughing matter. And regardless of what other people might say, we know that it's real. And we know that it's true. And it's all the more reason if you have any kind of love for people at all, hey, preach the gospel unto them. You have no excuses. It's your responsibility. It is your duty. And hopefully you love people enough to not want to see them burning forever in that eternal pit. We've got a great opportunity on Saturday. There's going to be a lot of people up here going soul winning. We need to make sure that we, we, we make this a part of our lives. Not just when there's big events. Not even just when it's posted in the bulletin. Preaching Christ is more than just at a time. Now we ought to make those times to make sure that we're doing it. To make sure that we're keeping up with it and doing our job, at least, at least at these times. But we ought to, it ought to become a part of your life so that anywhere you are is a great opportunity to try to give somebody the gospel and lead them to Christ. Look, Jesus is over here. Jesus is up there. This is what he has to say. He loves you. He wants you to be saved. We know what happens to people who don't receive Christ. And if that matters at all to you, I mean, it should. If it mattered to you in your own life, we need to share that with others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for saving our souls. Lord, for providing us salvation, for, for saving us from that, from that eternal, burning, fiery pit, dear Lord. We, we thank you for loving us enough. Even though we deserve that punishment, dear God, we thank you for washing away our sins. We thank you for Christ's gift of salvation when he died on the cross and rose again. God, I pray that you would please stir up our hearts, stir up our spirits today, dear Lord, and every day to not be neglectful of, of this truth, of the fact that hell is real, dear Lord, and the fact that it's our job to go out and get these people saved and that it's not good enough just to say, well, I'll just wait till they come to me or I'll wait for this perfect opportunity to arise. Lord, help us to make the opportunity arise. Help us to be bold, dear Lord. Help us to, to go out and win people to Christ. Dear Lord, I pray that you would please use us that we can reach as many people as humanly possible. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.